All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to the Museum of the Admiral for today's History for Lunch program. Uh, for those of y'all who are tuning in virtually, uh, we just ask that you please mute your microphone and use the chat for your questions. Uh, we'll finish the presentation today with a Q&A session for everyone. Uh, a couple of reminders. Our next History for Lunch is going to be on Wednesday, June 21st at noon. Uh, Paul Wand, who's with the Beekeepers of the Albemarle, uh, will provide information on the importance of bees and beekeeping. Um, that's going to be in conjunction with our new exhibit from the Smithsonian Institute, which is pollination investigation uh, outside here in the hallway. And then on Wednesday, July the 5th at noon, we're going to welcome Harry L. Watson, who is the Atlanta Distinguished Professor of Southern Culture at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, so he'll provide us with an introduction to the 17th century Albemarle region. Uh, so a couple of great presentations coming up this summer. And then today we welcome authors Susan Harold Burkhead, Patricia White, and Sam Harding. Uh, they're going to bring to us a photographic diary of dramatic and inspirational images that will visually speak in a personal, spiritual, and soulful way through Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, the historic African-American House of Worship and the site of the first Rosenwald School for African-American children in North Carolina has offered Susan and her family glorious sunrises, moody sunsets, changing seasons, and stunning weather events. And there's gonna be a book signing at the end of the program today as well. Uh, so please join us in welcoming uh, Ms. Birkin. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon and so glad you're here. And today for lunch, we're serving history. So uh, we look forward to any questions that you may have after the program. Uh, we'd love to hear any comments or, um, you know, thoughts that you might have about the presentation. For a few seconds, let's pause and take in this view. It's spectacular landscapes like this that led to the publishing of my book, Across the Field, Inspirational Images of Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. And boy, do we have a fascinating story to tell today. We're gonna journey down a few different paths um, that will reveal and, and show us how this book came to be. The book honors the beauty of creation and the history of a steadfast congregation, past and present. Um, and before we go any further and talk about the book, I want to introduce my dream team collaborators that are with us today, Patricia F. White and Sam Harding, who are seated right here. Uh, Patricia White has been a member of Warren Grove Church for her entire life, just like her parents and members of her family that precede her. She serves as a trustee, the organist for the senior choir, and is currently the church administrator. She has served in many other mission areas and leadership capacities, and she continues to serve throughout Eaton Chowan community. Patricia provided the history of the church and invaluable information uh, that added to the richness and depth of the book. Um, Da Vinci said, poor is the teacher whose student does not surpass him or her. Sam Harding is that. Sam Harding uh, was a former art student of mine when he was a child, and he has grown to find photography as his medium of choice. He received his first camera when he was 11 years old and has not stopped taking pictures since, and I'm so grateful for that, Sam. His favorite subjects are trains, landscapes, and beautiful scenes around historic Edenton. Currently, he's a rising junior at NEAT here in Elizabeth City, and he has already, at the young age of 16, right? You're growing so fast, won many photography awards, and we're all proud of that. Um, Sam is the son of Cynthia and Flint Harding, um, and Cynthia is here today with her father and sister and niece, so welcome too. 
um, we're excited to share the fascinating story of this photography book that brought together an unlikely collaboration. You'll hear today the remarkable history of a quaint African-American church, house of worship, in the Valhalla area of Chowan County. This lovely church sits back from the road and is banked against a cluster of beautiful trees. A vast sky surrounds the church and um, it's, it's more like a postcard for us. It happens to be our front yard or front porch view. So every day we get to step out and see changing weather events, um, extreme sunrises and sunsets as we will see today. We've been viewing this scene for over 40 years. The images on the pages of the book are certainly reflective of the beauty in the picturesque church um, that it radiates. But first, I want Patricia to come up here and share um, the history of the church before we move into the images. So Patricia, would you come and share the history? Good afternoon. As was mentioned, yes, I am the, what we call the church administrator for Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. It was established in 1875, and that was a log cabin structure. And then around 1892, it was rebuilt again. And it was dedicated, and they became members of the Middle Ground Union. I've even seen history where the first middle ground union meeting was held at Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Church. In 1920, they built the structure that we're now in, the one that you see on the, on the screen here. And from that, we've done uh, various renovations within that church. For an example, we'll start with, the first was the Rosenwald School. I can remember as a child going through that old structure and not knowing exactly what it was. I can remember the large windows that uh, was once in the building and then looking at everything in that building and just, and like I said, not even knowing that that was the first Rosenwald School in North Carolina. When we look at uh, the structure now, we use it for Sunday school. We use it as a dining room. It was annexed, annexed to the church in re, oh, let me back up. It was renovated in around about, around about 1986. Then in 1995, it was annexed with another Sunday school section. And when you look at the building itself, there are four sections, the church, the Sunday school rooms, <clears throat> the Rosenwall building, and then the last structure that was added on was uh, a complete dining room that will seat approximately 200 people. The Rosenwall School in itself was uh, purchased for $1,622. The, the community had to provide money, and that was uh, $486. The general public 836, and then the Rosenwald part was just about $300, the amount that was allotted for any of the schools that were being built. North Carolina led in this project with 813 schools, and, um, and that was among the highest among the 15 states in which uh, Julius Rosenwald um, provided the funds and those funds uh, came about simply because he was interested in what Booker T. Washington was saying uh, about educating uh, our, our children. And so when they got together, they uh, came up with the fund and it was incorporated around 1970. And from there, we, um, many, many schools and many, many children were educated. We have with us today 
one of the students that went to our, our school, uh, Ms. Tassi Casey. She's here with us today. And she may not have gone long, but she was there. And she has some good memories about the school itself. Warren Grove, uh, we're going through now, we've had 14 different pastors between 1875 and up to now. Our present pastor is Reverend Michael Foreman. He's out of Chesapeake and he will be celebrating his first year uh, uh, in September with us. Um, any other questions? I will do at the uh, at the end. Try to answer at the end. And um, is that enough information? That's right. All right. I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. All right. Um, let me move a little bit here. Uh, this is the picture of the three of us. It's in the book. This is an image I took that is from the perspective of the road that leads up to the church. So you can see here the buildings that Patricia just described. And if you're facing, if you're looking right now at the sanctuary and you move over to the long connecting piece, the, the uh, second building from the left is the Ro Rosenwald section. This is one of my favorite images in the book, and I did not take this photograph. This is uh, one of Sam's photograph using his drone. And it's spectacular because it shows the farmland surrounding the church and goes as far to uh, the horizon. So you get such a beautiful bird's eye perspective. Patricia mentioned the congregation and the new pastor who is um, in the front center of the image on the left, and then his wife, uh, Miss Phyllis, and some of the congregants that gathered one Sunday for us to take a group picture. And I'm real proud that we were able to bring some members in a photograph to the book. I wanted to share just a little bit more about the Rosenwald piece that um, is such a critical part of the story and had to be included in the book, in my opinion. Um, during the research for the book, I knew that the building was a Rosenwald school. I did not know it was the first one in North Carolina. And I began to research and go down all these rabbit holes, just learning so much about the Rosenwald schools. And then I was so um, almost in a state of shock that I didn't know anything about it. And I felt like it was a piece of lost history. Um, so it was important to include this in the book. Um, if you look on the, the uh, stage over to the far left, there's some poster images that we'll kind of go through um, as we talk about this amazing story. On the screen, you'll see Julius Rosenwald. He was the son of a Jewish immigrant who fled religious persecution in Germany in the mid 1800s. So his family came to America and immediately started in the garment industry. Eventually he became the president of Sears Roebuck and Company. And in Chicago from 1908 until 1932, Rosenwald is credited for turning Sears into the world's largest retailer. Y'all remember the Sears catalog? That was his idea. His exceptional new wealth enabled him to become the greatest philanthropist in American history. And here is why. Rosenwald saw having a sensitive heart and, and following his Jewish beliefs that America was weakened by the country's treatment of blacks during the Jim Crow era. And it deeply disturbed him. Schools were separate and equal, but they were not equal. The disproportionate amount of funding for black schools at that time was atrocious in comparison to white uh, schools for white children. The conditions in schools I've even read were worse than a barn or a stable. This, this bob bothered Julius Rosenwald so much he felt he needed to do something about it. 
but he believed in dignity and he believed in independent empowerment as the way to help others, um, which is a basic Jewish practice that, that he believed in. This is Booker T. Washington, and he wrote his autobiography, Up From Slavery. There's a copy on the stage that you can see later. Um, Rosenwald had heard of Booker T. Washington. It's very curious to meet him. Um, his, his story is fascinating. He was born into slavery in 1850 in Franklin, Virginia. He was zealous about education and, and self-taught from a young age, and he was determined to do something about education for Black Americans who were suffering severe injustices under Jim Crow. <clears throat> his autobiography describes his journey from slavery to becoming a founding principal or the founding principal of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He led the college from its start in 1881 until his death in 1915. So the two men met um, at, a, at a fundraising in Chicago and immediately Julius Rosenwald approached Booker T. Washington about his concern. And Booker T. said, well, I think we need to work together on this. So they joined forces and Booker T. Washington invited Rosenwald to tour Tuskegee Institute. And this is a photograph from them walking around the campus. And this is Booker T. Washington and Rosenwald seated at an event. So together, a Jewish immigrant and a black educator established the Rosenwald Washington model that required the buy-in and partnership of African-Americans communities, as well as the support of the local school system. The Rosenwald Foundation of Matching Grants began and Rosemont and Washington forged one of the earliest collaborations and attacked the challenge of ed educating black children with originality and sophistication. The construction campaign ran from 1912 until 1932. By the time the initiative ended due to consolidation, it had helped to create over 5,000 schools and associate buildings. They did not just build schools, they built shops and warehouses and ha homes for the teachers. It just went on and on. The Rosenwald schools were the greatest intervention in education that you've ever heard of. This is a, a historic sign marker in Edenton that we um, have and it also describes and commemorates the Rosemall School and the first one being at Warren Grove. I wanted to share with you an architectural plan that the students at Tuskegee Institute designed. They came up with about five floor plans and the community could decide what which one fit. And this was the floor plan very similar to the one at Warren Grove. It's a two teacher classroom with a division in the middle. They would draw the, a screen or pull a, a curtain down um, and they had two teachers in two classes. And this uh, came from a book, booklet that you could look through and actually look at the plans and pick maybe what your community might be interested in. And I like this because it's got a little bit of a tinted ink drawing and shows just a little bit of, of color and design with the plan. This is one of the oldest images of what we think Warren Grove School may have looked like. There really aren't any photographs of the original facility, but this one, I think, is as close as we can get. And then this is the Warren Grove School before it was annexed to um, the church. And at this time, it was the Tillett Educational Building. I think Patricia said that was remodeled in 1986. Is that correct? Yeah. And here's a sign marker that stands in front of the Rosenwald School at this time. So what does all this have to do with our book across the field. Where does this path lead? 
a two room schoolhouse in Shawan County. So if you look at this map and all the little dark dots will show you where all the schools were built by 1932, as Patricia mentioned, you'll notice there's a great concentration in the area of North Carolina. And if you find us, that, that would be the first one. So that's such a wonderful thing to know about um, our book and, and the Warren Grove School in North Carolina. Um, in November of, in October of 1915, the Warren Grove School was dedicated. And a year later in November of 1915, Booker T. Washington passed away at the age of 59. And he passed away from kidney disease re related to hypertension, but he was able to at least see some of these schools established. I wanted to show you a few of the things I discovered about the interior of the schools. Most of the schools ended up um, just disappearing, disrepair, um, and just returned back to the earth. There are about 10% that may still be um, structures that are up, but this would be the type of stove. Of course, there's no air conditioning and the desk. The desks were arranged so that the sunlight from all the windows in the building could cross over the desktop of the children and shine on their work. So windows were a critical piece of the buildings. So during all these years that I've been taking photographs of the church across the road during magnificent weather events, spectacular sunrises and moody sunsets, even lightning two times, I never understood the significance of this quiet, gentle church's place in history, but I do now. As an artist and novice photographer, I was dra drawn to this scenic subject. I was inspired to share my photographs in this book. Um, and it's really more than a, a picture book or a tabletop book now. It celebrates the beauty of the church, the beauty of nature, creation, and I think my part, favorite part of the book is the collaboration between Sam, myself, and Patricia. Just as Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald came together from pretty much different worlds, the three of us came together from our unique backgrounds and perspectives and made this happen. We've had a lot of fun. Um, Patricia and Sam have been extremely patient with me. <laughs> and have uh, willingly shared their time and interest and energy and information to make this book happen. Um, I would like to share that the way the book was set up, so is set up so that it's not so monotonous or redundant is that I broke the images down into seven days. So there's a week of images and each day takes you from sunrise throughout the day sunset and night and then you start your next day with a whole new day of images so as you go through the book you can take in one day at a time and then move to a next day and every image is different I wanted to conclude today about sharing a few images of the book I'm much more comfortable behind it in front of an easel there's a painting I did of the church and um also, just being able to take in the images that I see uh, that are so inspiring in a soulful way. So I'm going to take a few minutes right now and just let you view some of the images and just take them in and be inspired by what you see and enjoy them. And then we'll cut close with a few other comments and, of course, questions. The light is always on. This is a very interesting photograph. We were outside watching a, a storm one evening. And as the dark clouds moved behind the church, we were thinking, well, that's, that is pretty serious and intense. And of course, I was taking pictures. 
and um, captured this lightning, which as you know, is very hard to do. So this is one of my favorite images. It is not great resolution, right, Sam? <laughs> but, but it's an, a really cool picture. There are a lot of rainbows in the book. And I think uh, this is probably one of my favorites, if not the most favorite. And again, I credit this photograph to Sam. Um, he came out one night, I think, was it choir practice, Patricia? And set up some of his special lighting and was able to capture this image. And um, it's just beautiful. And I would like to end uh, the presentation today with this image. It's the last photograph in the book. And there's a quote that goes with this from Booker T. Washington, which I felt like was a good way to end the book. We should all rise above the clouds of ignorance, narrowness, and selfishness. And he truly practiced that. I'd like to sh uh, for Sam to come up here for a few minutes and share some of his technical um, expertise about his part in the book that you will find very interesting. I learned so much from Sam and Patricia and it would not have happened without his tech expertise. And I'm so grateful that Sam was able to contribute. Some of like the biggest challenges when editing photographs for this book was taking what was low, what was left of salvaging what was with the low resolution and making do with it and trying to get it to where we could put it in the book, whether it was bringing up like colors or sharpness or other types of um, fixing grain or boosting contrast. It kind of really helped make the make the images stand out better in the book, like such as this one. You know, we had the we boosted a lot of the colors, brought some of the sunset out, and that helped, you know, bring the sunset to what it is in the book. And then one of the other ones, like the lightning one, was really tricky just to get it as best as we possible could. So we lightning's really hard to capture. We really we knew we really wanted to have a light some of the lightning shots in the book, but it's just making it work was challenging. And some of the sunrises, they're always you know, perfect lighting, always really helps with making an image stand out. So, any questions about the uh, photography editing or Sam's part? You did a great job. I'm grateful for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tonight, WRAL Tar Heel Traveler will be featuring a, about a four minute segment on the book. And Scott Mason came out to Warren Grove during the pilgrimage tour and did, I don't know, hours of interviews and filming. And he's going to condense that into four minutes. So I'm excited to see what on earth he can do with hours and hours down to four minutes, but that is at 5.55 tonight on WRAL. You can load the app or you can uh, watch it online um, an hour later if you want to. And also, I'd love to invite all of you to come to the Children Arts Council on sat this Saturday, the 10th, from four to five. We'll be having another book signing and we will also be having an, an exhibit um, along with me and Sam, uh, five of his photographs will be available to purchase. They're fantastic. Um, and also five other artists will be exhibiting artwork. Also, the highlight of the event at 530 will be the Warren Grove Missionary Baptist Choir is going to perform. They performed um, in February and it was just so well received and we're excited about having you back. So we look forward to that. So I'd like to open it up for any questions now, if anyone has any questions or may have some through Zoom. 
Are there any Rosenwald schools in Elizabeth City? Are there any Rosenwald schools in Elizabeth City? There are. Um, in fact, there is one on the campus of Elizabeth City State University, I believe. I've not seen it, but I'm aware of that one. I think we just received a grant from the National Park Service. It, um, there's an article in the Daily Events, and I know that Dr. Stuckey and several of the other professors at Elizabeth City State have been looking for funding, and they're, I believe they have received a grant for the National Park Service. That's fantastic. Do you know the name of the school? I, I don't. Okay. I, I don't either. We were just looking up the ones in the area. There were several in Shawan County. There are two that are remaining. Any other questions? Yes. So what added to the disarray of some of the schools just kind of? Well, um, the Rosenwald Foundation, he, he set it up so that it would end. Um, he just wanted to give it a time period. And then consolidation. And then, um, you know, so once we had consolidation, then a lot of the, the county schools, the smaller schools moved into the, the larger uh, buildings. So in Edenton, they moved to DF Walker. And so, you know, a lot of them were just deserted and were not main, able to be maintained or were not maintained and just completely, you know, fell apart or disappeared which is sad, but that's what happened. Yeah. There is a book on the stage that uh, a photographer went around and photographed as many as he could. And you'll see that. I also have a children's book I discovered online uh, that's from uh, Brooklyn, New York, that was in their library about Rosenwald. And it's a beautiful children's book. To. So there's a lot of information out there to read. It's a fascinating story, but I think um, I decided to do the book and then learn the history behind the first school in North Carolina, which just has given uh, this book and this story just a wonderful element. The book is in the um, Library of Congress, so the history of the church is permanently sealed there. And I'm real proud of that too. Any other questions? Not a question, but it seems to me like uh, the ones that were well preserved and the ones that were built on church ground. Yes, that was a very common practice because the church was the center of the community and it made sense that the school would, would be there too. And if, if I'm not mistaken, were many of the teachers, some of the are religious leaders at the church or pastors or was that true or not okay but yes they were many were built near the church and we do have some books available for purchase um, near the gift shop we'll be sitting at a table if anyone would like to purchase an autographed copy and there are copies of my painting in print note card form as well Thank you all very much um, for coming out and being our guest um, for our history for lunch. We greatly appreciate it. It was very informative, and you all have a lot to be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, feel, feel free to come and look at the posters a little bit closer as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.